my Spotify playlist method is composed of naming thoughtfully and finding the right mix. So the way that I think about this in business or creating content. Hi, my name is Paige Findorty and you're listening to Seed to Harvest and I'm continuing my creative frameworks videos. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Spotify playlisting method. So I've always really loved music as long as I can remember and making playlists for people is an extension of that. In elementary school, I'd burn CDs of the one song a week I'd get to buy on iTunes for my friends and we'd swap. In middle school, I would playlist on a now defunct website called 8Tracks and then Spotify came around. Streaming global music was an incredible change from my limited choice of the one one ninety nine song a week and the variety it introduced was amazing, but it could be overwhelming. Today, I have 7,073 like songs and 180 playlists. I may not be an expert at playlisting, but I am experienced. And there's a few elements that I think about when making a playlist that I'll talk a little bit more about how they can apply to business or content a little bit later, but the two most important are the name and the right mix. So the name. For anyone who's read Patrick Rothfuss's The Name of the Wind, which if you're into naming and words, I would highly recommend. Names are really important. A few examples of the names of my playlist include Absolutely Feral for These Songs, A Nap on the Beach, Autumnal Equinox, Cherry Blossom Mise in Place, and, and my naming is representative of many other playlist curators on Spotify. So one of my secret ways to discover new music is by naming a vibe, perhaps like wearing flannels by the fire or something like that. For example, last weekend I headed up to Sea Ranch for the weekend for a girls trip and I was looking up cedar and flannel, coastal grandma fall, roasting pies to build a playlist for our drive. So Priya Parker in her book, The Art of Gathering talks about the importance of boundaries. And I think a great name can help you make better decisions on which songs to exclude in a playlist, which is really important when you have global variety and choice. So the conclusion I draw here is a name draws a circle around your intention. The second aspect that's really crucial is the right mix. The best Spotify playlist that you make for someone will have a handful of songs they love, a handful of songs by artists they recognize, and then some wild cards you think they might like. So when I play music in my house for a gathering, my measured success of a playlist is usually around someone saying like, ooh, what is the song? I love it or actually Shazam it. Side note, Shazam is one of my favorite apps ever. It's my favorite music app. And I did a senior project for a computer science class at SUSU on how it works in case you're curious to hear more about Fourier transforms. The key here is that familiarity makes people pay attention, but discovery is like the magic part of it. So my Spotify playlist method is really composed of naming really thoughtfully and also finding the right mix. So the way that I think about this in business or creating content is first in content, I use this approach when brainstorming writing ideas. So I think about what elements can I use that people will recognize and love that I've written or talked about before, and how can I incorporate surprise in new applications or directions? And I think this current series on creative frameworks is a really great example of that. I think that especially in surprising metaphors. Working in venture capital, everything is very abstract. So I like using metaphors. For example, my book, Seed to Harvest, is about a farmer who goes out and discovers passion for nurturing crops and then does that on a bigger and bigger scale. And it talks about the harvesting process. And that metaphor really brought venture capital down to earth for a lot of people. And I think that that can be very powerful. So never underestimate a metaphor in the Spotify playlist method. Of course, playlisting, I think one of my love languages is making people Spotify playlists. So I really like using this method of searching up those specific vibes and incorporating songs that I know the person likes or I think they might like. I use this for travel recommendations. So I recommend some things I think would be familiar. For example, if someone loves reading, I'll recommend like my favorite bookstore in a place, but I might also recommend like a crazy escape room. And then 
investing. I want to talk a little bit more about the name and how I think about applying that from an investing framework. So one of the things that is really challenging as an investor is to define a thesis. And this might be on sector or stage or the type of founder that you like to back. But I think one of the things that makes your investment repeatable and able to be applied time and time again by other people is really strong language that guides them in a way where they can make independent decisions. And this is how I thought about building Behind Genius Ventures from the beginning is how do I make my intuitive investing approach more explicit so that I can build a team that can also apply that approach with maybe a little bit of a different perspective. And so the way that I think about naming from an investment perspective is how do I pick out the elements across a pool of investments or a future facing realm and think about naming that. So our thesis naming has shifted. I would say like our investment strategy has stayed very similar, but we continue to iterate on what language keeps us top of mind with other investors, what language makes founders really say like, oh, like I, I understand that. And we've landed on the future of work and play and backing founders with three specific characteristics. One is really strong storytelling ability. One is having a strong mission. And the last is high execution velocity. So the ability to thoughtfully set direction and quickly execute on that direction. And I think this process of naming has been a big area of growth for me in the past year. It takes a variety of data points to be able to draw those conclusions. And it's a continuous refining process of what is the name that draws the boundary around opportunities that are interesting for us? Because you'll have your investment parameters. And I think this also goes back to Kevin McPherson's The Grid, where he talks about the grid being the language that makes art as an abstract more explicit and how you go through the process. And it's a repeatable process that anyone can apply. And I think that's what's really interesting about naming specifically. So if you're an investor and you're watching this video, I'd love to hear how your naming for your thesis or strategy has evolved over time because I really enjoy hearing stories about how firms have moved through this. And oftentimes it happens when one fund is raised, it's under one specific language, and then the market changes or the investments change or you learn something new. And then the language of that thesis changes for the next fund that they raise. One of the most common questions that I used to get when we were raising our first fund is like, how do you think about co-investors? And in venture capital, co-investors are the people or companies that are investing alongside you in a specific company. And there's kind of a spectrum of some investors, especially angels, will work like only with very specific funds. And then there's the other side of the spectrum where people want to invest wholly independently. And I find I fall somewhere in the middle. There's funds I really enjoy working with, and I also enjoy making my own independent decisions and bringing folks in after. And from a fund investor perspective, what I learned in Fund One is that when they're looking at the deals that you've done, some of the things they'll think about are like, who are other co-investors that we recognize? And then are there enough deals that are outside of that network? If you think of it as like a Venn diagram, you don't want to have like a complete overlap of things they know because then they're not learning anything new but you want to have a certain Venn diagram that allows them in that centerpiece to have a really thoughtful portfolio that's made up of things that might be familiar or recognizable and then some that might be a little bit off the beaten track. So I think about that when investing and building a diverse portfolio. And there's many more applications of this framework. I'd love to hear if you thought about this as well or other names that you might have for this method, but I hope you enjoy this video. I made my previous video on Kevin McPherson's The Grid and how I think about applying that to art investing in business. So if you want to check that out, that's also on wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. I'll leave the link in the description. And thank you so much for watching. And a very special thank you to Seed to Harvest podcast editor Tate Doherty for his amazing work on this episode.